All right, uh, thank you, Titus. Uh, good morning, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to uh, Obadiah, verse 1? Obadiah, verse 1. You should have my translation in front of you on, uh, uh, on the... Uh, and we're going to be putting the translation on the website, on our written library under Obadiah at, at, in the next uh, couple weeks or so, a week or two. Um, also, your songbook, page, turn to page 1. We're going to do a love song to my Savior, congregational song I wrote. Page one, and um, just a couple of announcements. Uh, the class, for those who are new to the ministry, hitting us on the website or somewhere else on YouTube somewhere. Our class schedule is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday evenings from 7 to 8 p.m. And also Sunday mornings from 9 to about 10.15. We observe the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month. And then the classes usually run to around 10.30 then. We have a brunch out here in Iowa, uh, usually after, um, after class on Sunday. We don't have it today. Jody's uh, sick. So you can keep her in prayer. And uh, it's weird not having her here. So she's uh, in, in bed. So keep her in prayer. And she's not hadn't felt well the last couple of days. So um, Also, um, uh, we're an expository type ministry, meaning we go through the different books of the Bible, verse by verse, uh, paragraph by paragraph, book by book. And we do different subjects in between books. So um, our, when we finish Obadiah, which will be sometime in, at the end of February, uh, the next book we're going to do is First Thessalonians. We're going to do First Thessalonians, and that's in the New Testament. So we go back and forth. Our, our weekday classes were in First John. So when we finish First John, we'll go to the, an Old Testament book when we finish that book. And uh, also, we have, I just want to make an announcement about, because people are asking about it. And I, I thought I mentioned this probably in the past, and I should probably made it take the time at the beginning of class and say something about it. If you notice, the last couple of weeks, we've had on our website the financial notice. We mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, about the situation. So we're back in the black, but uh, the, with the caveat that if, you know, the people who are contributing and have you know, committed to help us out, um, that's, that's great. If somebody decides they're not going to do it, you know, if enough people do that, then we're going to be back in the red again. So right now, we're, we're, we're in good shape. I mean, this is always the case in ministries. You know, uh, financially, this this stuff always is the case, and so, um, but we're in we're st we're still going here in Iowa, and um, and uh, amazingly, we're here. I've been here for se over seven years now. So, so the fight we'll be having the financial take notice taken off, and thank you for those who contributed. More importantly, the Lord thanks you because this is His ministry, and I said this from the beginning. It's not about Bill; uh, He's using me to, to get the word of God out, and and you guys to support it in this area, so um, thank you for those who, uh, who, uh, who have already been given for a while and then have actually added on to what they were already giving. I appreciate that. That's very good. And, and again, as I said before, the Lord is the one you're serving by doing that because uh, it's his ministry, his word that we're trying to get out to his people. So uh, that's, uh, so don't, uh, don't worry. No, don't, please don't, you know, email or call me up and, you know, I, People call me. Hey, it's gonna be loud. It's gonna be loud. Say, no, we, we're all right. We're, you know, we're still going, and so I'm glad that there's some people that are concerned about the ministry. That's that's nice. It's encouraging to hear. All right, that out of the way. Let's uh, take a moment of silent prayer, as is our custom. Oh, oh, oh! Wait a minute, wait a minute. I almost forgot. We have two birthdays that just passed by real recently. Crystal McMurray, and uh, she her birthday was. Uh, uh, what, yesterday, two days ago? Yesterday. Yesterday was 11th, right? Okay. All right, Le and, and Tyler's was on the same day on Veterans Day. You see both on, on vet Veterans Day. So Tyler, he's listening on the internet. I talked to him last night. He's out in Iowa State. So he's listening online. So I'd like to sing happy birthday to both of them at the same time. So uh, let's go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Tyler and Crystal. Happy birthday to you. Yay. All right. Mummy and Tyler's birthday. So Tyler, I think, is, is, he told me I've been I kind of like uh, prying. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, when I call Tyler, I always try to dig inf information. He's very tight-lipped kind of guy. He's very, he should work for the CIA or something, you know, or intelligence, because he, he doesn't let anything out. It's like, so I just drive, I just drive him crazy. Just ask, 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 ask. And so I find, you're going to come out for Thanksgiving. You're going to come out for Thanksgiving. He's coming out for Thanksgiving. He promised, so we'll see him at Thanksgiving. So, and then he has got to go back, and then he's got to uh, get ready for the finals and stuff. So keep him in prayer. And again, as I said before, uh, we need to keep Jody in prayer. Jody, Jody does a lot of things for a lot of people, and uh, it's people like her that 
are, are like pillars of a church because they're always ser they're serving and they're always helping other people out. She remembers everybody's birthday. She's always doing, and you know, you, everybody knows who's been around Jody knows what I'm talking about. So she loves the Lord. So keep her in prayer for her to be in bed right now. She doesn't feel well, so that's kind of concerning to me. And uh, so, anyways, and also. Another very encouraging person in my life, another woman, uh, Lori Coppersmith. Keep her in prayer. She's been battling all kinds of illness. Her husband has a serious issue. She lives in Alabama. She follows us and supports this ministry. So if you keep her in prayer as well. She's got health issues as well. So are you going to be all right? Are you going to be all right, buddy? <laughs> He's too cute. All right, let's take a moment of silent prayers as our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, to see if we're in fellowship with God. We confess our sins so that we can uh, get back in fellowship with God. We maintain that fellowship by our, by our obedience to the Word of God. That's when we're obeying the Holy Spirit because He speaks to us through the Scriptures which He's inspired. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing and distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because He cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for another day to study your word. We thank you for giving us another opportunity to gather together with each other as members of the body of Christ, the future bride of Christ, and study your almighty word. We thank you for everyone here this morning. We thank you for those who might be viewing or listening to this class through the website or at a later date through the recordings on the website. We thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson's hospitality and opening up their home to us four days a week. We thank you for Titus's work with the sound, the recordings, the video, the audio. We pray you give him wisdom in that area and thank you for his service to technology and people taking advantage of it. We also uh, thank you, Father, for uh, this study in Obadiah. We pray that you would help me to communicate accurately your full counsel to your people when we study this book this morning. We pray that your people will receive their necessary spiritual nourishment. As a result, we also pray that you would help them by the power of the Spirit to understand what's being taught, to comprehend it, and to make application of what's being taught and to have a, a sincere and sensitive heart to the things of God, and we just thank you for this study in Obadiah. We also uh, pray, Father, for the song service. We pray, Father, that by the power of the Spirit, you'll help us to sing in a manner that's uh, acceptable to, as an acceptable form of worship to both your son and, your, and yourself. We also lift up Jody, and we just pray, Father, for her health. We pray, Father, for also for Lori Coppersmith and her health, and we just pray, Father, that you would um, heal them both, and we just pray, Father, that uh, you would, and we thank you for them, and be in our lives, and we just pray, Father, that you would uh, get them back to full health uh, shortly, Father. We thank you, Father, uh, for the, raising them up in, uh, in the service that they perform for us and for you. So, Father, we pray for this uh, service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, could you all rise, please? We're going to do a love song to my Savior. Come on, buddy, time to sing. Oh, you got a song book. You're going to read, but, huh? Son of a gun. You crew. Page one, yeah. Page one. Hi. You waving at me. He's waving at me now. He's so cute. Hi. It's so cute. Look at that. The kid's waving at me. Makes me want to go get married and have a kid. Not. I don't know, maybe. I sing song to you Jesus the one who I adore I lift my voice to the heavens and praise 
of your love so pure Oh, I'm in love with you, Jesus For wiping my sins all away Yes, I'm so in love with you, Jesus I think of you all It should be at Obadiah verse 1. Remember, there's only one chapter in the book. And uh, we're going to be uh, looking at verse 9 here this morning, where God, uh, through the prophet Obadiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, predicts that he will destroy Edom's military. We're talking about the nation of Edom, Edom and God's uh, uh, dis uh, displeasure with the nation of Edom. And for qu quickly, by way of review, for those who might be dropping in for the first time, and it's also good to review what we're, where we're at, uh, this book was written at, at the... Uh, toward the end of the 6th century BC, sometime after, uh, probably 25, uh, within 25 years of the destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah uh, in, uh, in, um, in 587 BC. Uh, remember, uh, Edom, was the, uh, they're the descendants of Esau, and Esau and Jacob, of course, were twin brothers, and so therefore, the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites, and uh, in the context of the book of Obadiah, the southern kingdom of Judah, and the Edomites, who were descendants of Esau, were blood relatives. So God was very angry and upset with Edom uh, because of this, because they actually helped out Babylon in the destruction of the southern kingdom of Judah. So God says, uh, as you treated your blood relatives, the, the Jews, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar attacked them and destroyed them as a national entity, so I will do the same to you people. And so this is what this book is, this is why this book was written. It's a prophecy against the nation of Edom, which was actually fulfilled. Uh, uh, the destruction of the Edom as a national entity took place 
uh, by, with the Babylonians uh, sometime at the end of the 6th century BC. And uh, pretty much they were uh, driven from their homeland, just like the passage says. They didn't have a central government anymore. But it's interesting, and you see the 70th week of Daniel and Daniel 11, uh, you'll see that Edom actually is existing again as a nation. And then they will finally be destroyed. And when we get to those prophecy about this future destruction of Edom as a national entity in verses 17 through 21 of this passage, which is a prediction of what will take place uh, dur during the millennial reign of Christ in the 70th week of Daniel, we'll see that Jesus Christ, it actually is a passage in Isaiah, he says he comes from Edom with blood on his garments. So basically when he comes back at his second advent, he destroys the Antichrist and the tribulational armies, and Edom will probably take their hand, will probably be involved in this attack against Jesus Christ at his second advent when he comes back with us, the church and the elect angels to establish his millennial kingdom on the earth and end the 70th week of Daniel. That's going to be a fun study, those last five verses of, Ed, uh, of Obadiah. So that's where we're standing at, at this particular point in our study, looking at verse 9 here this evening, uh, this morning. And what we'll see is uh, we're going to talk a lot about, we've been doing this uh, quite a bit up to this point, and we'll continue to do this throughout the book. And you see this in Zephaniah, is the, uh, the fact that the, there's a lot of talk about God's judging. And God is a judge, and this is something we, have, we all have to uh, come to grips with as human beings, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. Uh, everyone will have to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account for his life. So for the, the next great judgment actually is the church after, immediately after the rapture, which is imminent, the, called the Bema Seat Evaluation of the Church. Uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't mean it's, it's a time where we're going to uh, be determined whether we're going to go to the lake of fire or not. No, we're justified through faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior, so therefore we escape the judgment, the wrath of God in the, in, at the great white throne judgment and the, uh, the subsequent great, uh, the lake of fire. So we're spared that judgment, but we'll have to go give an evaluation of our service as Christians, to see if we were good stewards with the time, talent, treasure, and truth that God gave us. And if we were, we get a full reward. If we don't, we lose rewards. So uh, we don't lose our salvation. Now, we saw, this, we saw that in the past. After that, there's another judgment that comes at the second advent of Christ, uh, which ends Daniel's 70th week, which Daniel's 70th week takes place sometime after the rapture. We don't know exactly how, what's the interval of time, but we do know when the 70th week begins. It begins with the Antichrist establishing a treaty with the leadership of Israel at that time. It's noted in Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 27. We studied that book in detail, and that verse in quite extensive detail. So it ends with the second advent of Christ, this uh, 70th week of Daniel. And that's, uh, that's 70th week of Daniel is when we have all those judgments of revelation taking place. So we're spared from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 teaches, te teaches that. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 does as well. So we're spared from that, that wrath of God that will take place during the 70th week of Daniel. The second advent ends that time. And we see at that time, Jesus Christ will judge the Jews when he comes back to this plant, planet Earth, and then he judges the Gentiles. Noted in Matthew 25, the Jews, their judgments mentioned in Ezekiel 20. So everybody's going to have to stand before Christ. So we have, uh, at the second advent, the Jews who reject him as Savior are taken off the earth, and they're deposited into a place called uh, torments underneath the earth, and then they're eventually, at the end of history, human history, they go, prior to the uh, creation of new heavens and new earth, they go to the great white throne judgment of all non-believers. Then, after the Jews are judged, only Jewish believers remain, and at the second advent, the majority of Jews will have trusted in Jesus Christ, unlike the first advent when the majority rejected him, and only a small remnant believed. Now, he goes to the Gentiles after that, and all the non-believing Gentiles are ushered off the earth by the elect angels. Only the believers will su uh, survive. So all those uh, Jewish and Gentile believers, they're going to be the ones that uh, uh, begin the millennial reign. Only believers will start off the millennial reign of Christ. Those who survive the events of the tribulation period, uh, they and are still around when Christ comes back at his second advent, they'll repopulate the earth. And uh, so then uh, we see that at the end of uh, the, the end, end of the millennial reign, Satan is released for a little while. He comes back, starts another rebellion, and the offspring of those Jewish and Gentile believers who repopulated the earth, the majority of those will go in, they throw their hat in with Satan again, 
and they'll attack uh, the, the Jerusalem and Jesus Christ, and they'll be destroyed by God. Then we have the, that's the, technically the end of human history as we know it in this time, matter, space continuum. Then we have the great white throne judgment of every non-believer. Okay? We're, not, we're not at that judgment as far as we're not going to face Jesus Christ for that judgment because we've been spared from the wrath to come. John 3.36, uh, we're taught that if we believe in Jesus, uh, we're delivered from God's wrath. And uh, so all non-believers are judged at that time. So I mention all these judgments because everyone's going to have to stand before Christ. God is judge, and he's the creator, and he has a right to hold his creatures accountable, and he will. And he is doing that now. He judges not only have these final judgments uh, that we have in Scripture, but we also have uh, the fact that God judges the nations and individuals today. Uh, let's just take the church, for instance. He judges his own people in the sense that he disciplines us. Uh, if we decide we're going to be living in apostasy, which is basically unrepentant sin, where we decide, no, we're not going to confess our sins, and we're not going to obey God's word, and this is an habitual activity, he will discipline us because he loves us. And uh, that's very important we understand that. So he disciplines his children to hold them accountable because he knows that being out of fellowship with him is detrimental and destructive to them. So he, as his loving parent, he will discipline us. And so, uh, he, so he holds us accountable. He also, the non-believers he holds accountable. He, he holds rulers accountable. He judges rulers. He judges nations. And history is strewn with the wreckage, as I said many times in the past, of nations and individuals whom God has judged because of their unrepentant sinful behavior. So this, is, this book, Obadiah, is basically uh, telling us, that, teaching us that God holds people accountable for, and nations for their activities, and Edom is a case in point. So we should be smart and, and put these things together, two and two together, that, and be aware of the fact this should give us, what did it say in, in, the, in the Old Testament? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, when I say fear, we should be ever respectful. We should be fear, not in the sense that we are petrified of God. But if we're a non-believer, I would be. But if you're a believer, you should, you know, you don't, you're not petrified of your father. But you have a healthy, you should have a healthy respect for your father. Well, that's what we should too, as Christians, as believers, children of God. We should have a healthy respect for our heavenly Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that means if we do, that means that we're going to stay in fellowship with Him, keep short accounts with God, confess our sins when necessary, obey His word, be conscientious about learning and obeying God's word, and not take God's word and be flip about it and take it for granted and uh, and, 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 and 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 treat it like it's any other book. It's not just any other book. It's a book that God inspired men to put down in full, his full counsel in writing to us. So we, be, we should be very uh, serious about when, it, when God's speaking to us through his word. So God holds individuals and nations to account. He judges them. Now, look at Obadiah, with that review out of the way, look at Obadiah verse 1. We're going to read the whole book as we've been doing. It's only one chapter, 21 verses. And then we're going to look at verse 9. So by doing this, we're looking at verse 9, our passage, in its immediate context. Very important we study the Bible that way. We don't want to, the cults, false teachers do that. They'll take scriptures and they will not study in them and interpret them in their proper context. A lot of, you go to a lot of churches this morning and you'll see that go to one of these churches and they'll have a passage the guy will teach on, but he jumps off onto something that has nothing to do with the passage and he jumps into something, uh, whether it's money or whether it's something about uh, that's a social uh, uh, agenda he has or a political thing. It has nothing to do with the word of God. That's not what you want to do. You want to pay attention to context, interpret the passage in its context, immediate and in the context of the entire book and in context of the entire Bible. Obadiah verse 1 says, and I'm reading from the Net Bible, the vision that Obadiah saw. The Lord God says this concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord. An envoy was sent among the nations saying, Arise, let us make war against Edom. The Lord says, Look, I will make you a weak nation. You'll be greatly despised. Your presumptuous heart has deceived you. You who reside in the safety of the rocky cliffs, whose home is high in the mountains. You think to yourself, no one can bring me down to the ground. And of course, he's referring to their geographical location, which was south of the kingdom of Judah, south of what is Israel, known as Israel today. It's known today as Jordan. And uh, so they're in that area where Petra is, very famous area. So they were, had a high geographical location. And so this made them 
think that they were impregnable, uh, invulnerable to an attack. Verse 4, even if you were to soar high like an eagle, even if you were to make your nest among the stars, I can bring you down even from there, says the Lord. If thieves came to rob you during the night, they would steal only as much as they wanted. If grape pickers came to harvest your vineyards, they would leave some behind for the poor, but you will be totally destroyed. How the people of Esau will be thoroughly plundered. Their hidden valuables will be ransacked. All your allies will force you from your homeland. Your treaty partners will deceive you and overpower you. Your trusted friends will set an ambush for you. That will take you by surprise. At that time, the Lord says, I will destroy the wise sages of Edom, the advisors from Esau's mountain. Your warriors will be shattered, O Teman, so that everyone will be destroyed from Esau's mountain. Then, in verses 10 through 14, he gives the list of indictments for the basis of their being judged by God. Because you violently slaughtered your relatives, the people of Jacob, shame will cover you, and you'll be destroyed forever. You stood aloof while strangers took his army captive, and foreigners advanced to his gates, speaking of the, this was fulfilled in history with the Babylonians. So he's speaking of something that took place in the past from the writer's perspective. So this is after the destruction of the, the kingdom of Judah. When they cast lots over Jerusalem, you behaved as though you were in league with them. You should not have gloated when your relatives suffered calamity. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah when they were destroyed. You should not have boasted when they suffered adversity. You should not have entered the city of my people when they experienced distress. You should not have joined in gloating over their misfortune when they suffered distress. You should not have looted their wealth when they endured distress. You should not have stood at the fork in the road to slaughter those trying to escape. You should not have captured their refugees when they suffered adversity. For the day of the Lord is approaching for all the nations. Just as you have done, so it will be done to you. You will get exactly what your deeds deserve. For just as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and they will gulp down. They will be as though they had never been. But on Mount Zion, there will be a remnant of those who escape. And it will be a holy place once again. The descendants of Jacob will conquer those who had conquered them. The descendants of Jacob will be a fire, and the descendants of Joseph a flame. The descendants of Esau will be like stubble. They will burn them up and devour them. They, there will not be a single survivor of the descendants of Esau. Indeed, the Lord has spoken it. But people of the Negev will take possession of Esau's mountain, and the people of the Shephelah will take possession of the land of the Philistines. They will also take possession of the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and the people of Benjamin will take possession of, the, of Gilead. The exiles of this fortress of the people of Israel will take possession of what belongs to the people of Canaan as far as Zerphath. And the exiles of Jerusalem, who are in Sepharad, will take possession of the towns of the Negev. Those who have been delivered will go up on Mount Zion in order to rule over Esau's mountain. Then the Lord will reign as king. So there is the entire book all 21 verses. Now let's look at verse 9 in detail. The ESV translates verse 9, O oh, your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. Now when he says, and your mighty men shall be dis uh, dismayed, O Teman, that's a result clause because it's presenting the result of the previous prophetic declaration in verse 9. So uh, as we saw in verse 8, if you look at verse 8 again in the, uh, the Annette Bible, at that time the Lord says, I will destroy the wise sages of Edom, the advisors from Esau's mountain, uh, that's basically saying the military and political advisors and the, the, the people who gave wise counsel uh, to, as the leadership of Edom will be destroyed. They'll be killed. And so the result is the warriors, the soldiers, the foot soldiers, they don't have anybody to, uh, to, uh, wise to oversee them. So because the head's been cut off, they'll be destroyed. And if the military has no one, it can't protect the nation, its citizens, then the people will be uh, destroyed. Thus goes the nation. So this is what is being said here. So verse 9 is telling us that the result of the political and military leadership, the intelligentsia of Edom, and they were known for their wise men in that day, as a result of their destruction, the soldiers, the, that's what the mighty men's referring to, the, the, the valiant soldiers, they're going to be without leadership, and that's going to lead to the destruction of the military. So when it says your mighty men, that's used in a collective sense of Edom's valiant, 
brave and courageous soldiers living during the period in which the God of Israel judges her through other pagan Gentile nations located in the Mediterranean and Mesopotamian regions of the world during the 6th century BC. Now this term, this expression, your mighty men, it refers to military heroes, or in other words, those who distinguish themselves in combat. So Edom's soldiers, well, because they lack leadership, are going to be, uh, they're going to be destroyed on the battlefield, and so that will result in the end of Edom as a national entity. When it says, shall be, they'll be dismayed, that refers to the dismay that Edom's mighty warriors will experience as a result of their political and military advisors being killed. Now, Teman, I pointed out in pa this in passing when reading through the whole uh, book, it's a, it was a prominent city of Edom. That's, it's, that's, what it's refer it, that's why it's used. It's a prominent city of Edom. Its name is derived from the name of the grandson of Esau, if you compare this with what I'm saying with Genesis 36, 11. Now, this word contains what we call a figure of speech called the synecdoche of the part for whole. That means that the word is representing all of Edom and not just this prominent city. This is a common figure in Old Testament uh, literature. Now, the phrase, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter. That's presenting the result of the consequence of the previous prophetic declaration. So as a result of the mighty soldiers, the soldiers of Edom's military being dismayed because of lack of political and military leadership, uh, the peop regular citizens, ordinary citizens, every man, that's what that represents, they're going to be uh, slaughtered by a foreign army. When it says they'll be cut off, that's expressing the idea that the God of Israel will violently execute as criminals the Edomite people as a result of their crimes against the kingdom of Judah, which we just read are listed in Obadiah verses 10 through 14. And then Mount Esau, that refers to the mountainous region in which the nation of Edom resided in the 6th century BC. And thus it speaks of the mountain God gave Esau and his descendants to inhabit. You can compare that with Deuteronomy 2.5. Now, if you could, look at my uh, translation of Obadiah verse 1. We'll read up to verse 9. Obadiah verse 1 in my translation. It says in Obadiah verse 1, Obadiah's vision, this is what my sovereign Lord says concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord. Consequently, an envoy has been dispatched among the nations. Arise, yes, let us arise up against, let us rise up against her for war. Behold, I will surely cause you to be insignificant among the nations. You'll be greatly despised. Your presumptuous heart has caused you to enter this state of self-deception. You who live in the rock cliffs, your lofty dwelling place, who say within your heart, who will cause me to be brought down to the ground? Even if you were to soar high like the eagle, indeed, even if you were to make your nest among the stars from there, I could cause you to be brought down, declares the Lord. If thieves came... To you, if robbers came during the night, would they not want to steal only their sufficiency? If crop harvesters came to you, would they not want to leave gleanings? Oh, how you will certainly be destroyed. Oh, how the descendants of Esau will certainly be plundered. Their hidden valuables will certainly be ransacked. Each of your allies will certainly force you from your territory. Your treaty partners will certainly cause you to be deceived. They will certainly conquer you. Your trusted friends will set an ambush for you. There will be absolutely no intelligence concerning it. During this particular time, declares the Lord, will I not absolutely cause the wise men from Edom, specifically the advisors, to be killed from Esau's mountain? Consequently, your mighty warriors will certainly experience dismay, O Teman, so that the people from Mount Esau will be violently executed like criminals because of this slaughter. So, there's verse 9. And now, if you notice something, if you read this book, and I mentioned this in passing as well, notice that God, with Edom, in dealing with them, the punishment fit the crime. Basically said, you did this to them, your, 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 your blood relatives, the, the kingdom of Judah, the Jews, when Babylon attacked them, and you went in league with Babylon, well, just like you betrayed them, I'm going to have you, you're going to be betrayed by your treaty partners, as we just read, okay? And you're, what you think are friends, your allies, no. They're going to turn against you, betray you, because you betrayed 
your, bro- your blood relatives, the Jews. Now, God does this with nations. Okay? Thus, you can understand why God doesn't take kindly if we break treaties. That's something we don't, we don't, whether it's our nation or any nation, you do not break treaties. God, is, this is one of the examples of it. You, should, they should, you don't break treaties, God holds nations to account. So, and individuals, think about the application for it. If God's doing this with a nation, what does he do with individuals? You betray somebody else. Now you, you do something against somebody, you steal from somebody, you rob somebody, you lie about, you slander somebody, whatever it is that you've done to another person, you better repent of that. If you, you, first you confess it to God, and then you go to the person that you've done this to and deal with them and say, hey, I apologize. At least give them an apology. And if you stole property from them, offer restitution. In many cases, restitution, uh, which is taught in Leviticus 6, taught by Jesus, uh, and acknowledged by Jesus in other passages. If you're not right with your brother, brother, he said in the Sermon on the Mount discourse, you're not right with God. So uh, the Edom was not right with the, their blood relatives, the Jews, and they were unrepentant about it, and God destroyed them. Now, if they had repented like the Ninevites did when God drew, used Jonah to re- cause them to repent, if they repented like the Ninevites, God would have withheld, relented, and would not have judged them. We saw that when we looked at Jonah. We studied that book in detail. We mentioned that last week, I believe, in that passage. So God holds people, individuals to account, and nations to account. This is something that we need to pay attention to and uh, in our own lives. And uh, one of the reasons why we should pray for our nation as well, that we're, when we say we're going to do something, we do something. We don't betray other, uh, our allies or any other nation. And so we need to make sure that we pray for our leaders because our leaders, are, we're in the devil's world and Satan is the god of this world and demon officers of his are all over the nations of the earth. This is his world, including the United States is under his command temporarily. There's only one nation that has an elect angel over it. That's the nation of Israel. And that's only to keep her uh, from getting destroyed by Satan. And so Michael the elect angel, we saw that in Daniel. And we, it's in Jude too. So... Uh, we need to pray for our leaders. We're commanded to do that in First Timothy chapter two. And one of the things we we want to, reason why we want to keep uh, pray for them, as we saw, is so that we can live a quiet and tranquil life. If our leaders, and this is a perfect example of the Book of Edom with the nation of Edom in history, Edom's leadership, military and political leadership, gets dis- decimated, destroyed, and that's the d- destruction of the nation. So we need to pray for our leaders. We want to make sure that, and I don't, and this is why I say. Forget, you got to get over, you got to start think, think, thinking spiritual. Get over the political party thing. Get, start looking at these people as Christ, people Christ died for. Okay? Pray for them as you're commanded to. And, they, and so if you don't like somebody, you don't like their views, more than enough, more reason to why you should pray for them. Because that will protect your family. And if you don't pray for your, your nation, you're only hurting yourself and your own families and your, in your nation, the citizens of this nation. We pray for our leaders. That's commanded of us in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So if you look at verse 9, again, as we pointed out, that perfected, prophetic declaration in verse 9 is presenting the result of the previous one in verse 8. And in the one in verse 8, as we read, the Lord asserted to Obadiah, that during the particular period of time in the future when he will judge Edom, he will cause the wise men from Edom, specifically her political and military advisors, to be killed from Esau's mountain. Now here in verse 9, the God of Israel, through Obadiah, asserts that Edom's warriors will certainly experience dismay so that the people from Esau's mountain will be violently executed in war because of the slaughter. So therefore the dismay of Edom's mighty warriors will be the direct result of her political and military leadership being killed. So this is telling us the importance of a nation having strong military and political leadership. Very important that we have this. Now there'll be a loss of, what we see here is that because of the loss of the military and political leadership in the nation, there's a loss of morale among the foot soldiers, the troops, because of the deaths of those who compose their military and political leadership, political leadership, military and political leadership. With no leadership, her military will suffer defeat. I don't care how great the military is, our nation included. If we don't have good, strong leaders in our military and, po- and political head, uh, leadership, we're in trouble. But we need leadership. God has designed leadership. He's the author of leadership, authority. Without a th- strong authority, uh, whether it's in a home, uh, in a marriage, uh, with parents, or in a uh, school, or in a nation, or a town, or a church. If you don't have strong leadership, that's not good. 
That's not good. You're gonna you know, whatever the entity is, it will be uh, it'll be in dis it'll be in di it'll be destroyed. It'll be just it, whether it's a family or whether it's a nation or a local assembly of a church. So consequently, with this loss of military and political leadership, this will lead to the rest of her citizens being killed in battle because they'll be slaughtered. Or in other words, they'll be killed in great numbers. This prophetic declaration in Obadiah 9 is predicting the destruction of the Edomite army, which was fulfilled with the, when the Babylonians took Jerusalem and, uh, and also the Arabs uh, came by sometime after that as well, invaded Edom and took over the cities, driving the Edomites to the west. Uh, that's, but Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was the one that drove them, uh, basically knocked them out as a national entity. And then they kind of meandered west and the Arabs drove them out of there too. So we see the, this prophetic declaration in verse 9 is bringing to a climax the prophecies contained in verses 5 through 8. Verses 5 and 6, as we pointed out, predict that Edom's wealth will be plundered. Verse 7 predicts that her allies and treaty partners will betray her. Verse 8 predicts that her wise men, and specifically her military and political leaders, will be killed. Now here in verse 9, we have the prediction that Edom's military will be destroyed, resulting in the killing of great numbers of the Edomite citizenry. Now again, back to that point I made before, punishment fits the crime. What we see is Judah was betrayed by her blood relatives, the Edomites. They were attacked by Babylon. They had their wealth plundered. They had, they were, their military was destroyed. They were basically, their leadership, their political military leadership was executed by Nebuchadnezzar. And Edom was involved in that. They helped them out do that. So what happens? What comes around goes around. God says, okay, I'm going to deal this, what you did to them and what happened to them, I'm going to do to you, Edom. Every single thing that you, what you did to them, your whole fabric of your culture, your society, your nation is gone. Just like the, the uh, uh, Ju uh, southern kingdom of Judah is. In fact, we see that southern kingdom of Judah came back 70 years later in fulfillment of prophecy because God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and the new covenant that which guarantee the future restoration and regeneration of the nation of Israel. Guaranteeing, as it says in Jeremiah 31, that the Jews will never cease to exist. They will always exist despite the attempts of Hitler and Stalin and other idiots throughout the history, tyrants who try to kill the Jews and wipe out the Jews, including Antichrist in the future, who will be the greatest anti-Semite of all. Uh, none of them will be successful because God's word says, no. When I say, goes. So, the very structures of society and its constituent elements of economic well-being, wise rule and military security through armed force and international treaty in Edom will topple. Basically, that's what we're seeing in the first nine verses of Obadiah. Now, this prophetic declaration recorded in verse 9 is expressing the idea that the God of Israel will violently execute as criminals the Edomite people as a result of their crimes that they committed against the citizens of the kingdom of Judah. And those crimes, as we pointed out, are listed in verses 10 through 14. Now, this verse, is, verse 9, is expressing the idea, expressing the concept of God's wrath or we could, when we talk about God's wrath, we're talking about his righteous indignation towards the Edomite people for their crimes against the Jews of the southern kingdom of Judah in the 6th century BC. So when we talk about God's wrath in scripture, it speaks of his righteous indignation. What do I mean by righteous indignation? It's God's legitimate anger towards evil and sin. Both evil and sin are contrary to his holiness or perfect character in nature. What's evil? Evil in its root essence. Some people say, it's sin. It is sin. Evil is sin. But also, it's deeper than that. Evil is also an attitude of independence from God. How do we express that independence from God as if we're a non-believer? I don't need Jesus Christ as my Savior. I, on my own righteousness, can get into heaven. I'm a good person. That's evil. That's a, that, that permeates our culture and the world today. It's called self-righteousness. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10 and Romans 3.23. That's an independent attitude. Satan says in Isaiah 14, 12-14, he mentions five I wills. 
I will be like the Most High. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And every, each one of those five wills, I wills, express his independence from God. Before Satan ever did anything, ver verbally or overtly, any action, it was sin in his heart that led him to do what he did. It caused his attempted coup d'etat of the throne of God, amazingly. So he decided he was going to live independently of God. He wanted a, a, an alternative to worshiping God. And God said, no, that ain't going to happen. And God judged Satan. He was sentenced to the lake of fire with those angels, the third of the angels that went in league with him. Uh, mentioned in Revelation 12.10, Satan was, Matthew 25.41, God says, Satan has been, the lake of fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels. That, and the sentence is not executed yet, though. And he's temporarily the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Is there some contradiction in Scripture? No. Satan's not, his sentence has not been executed yet. And it won't be until the great white throne judgment. So he is deceiving the world now, and he's attempting to live independently of God right now. And he's influencing people to do this. God hates that. He's the creator. He expects and, and actually is very justified, of course. He's perfectly justified in requiring people to worship him. He created them to worship him and serve him, not to live independently and, bring the, and come about with their own kingdom. So what we see right now in history, and angelic in human history, is God is at this point, and it'll never happen again, once this all is, God is dealt with us, once he take, deals with this, it'll be proven to both men and angels that God is holy, and you cannot live independently of him and succeed. And Christians live independently of God. How do they do that? I don't need the word of God. I don't need a church. The hand can't say to the, uh, can't the body, the, the, the hand can't say to the, 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 the foot, I have no need of you, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. You can't live independently of the body of Christ, but many Christians are doing that today. I know Christians today in my comp apartment complex, sitting in their apartments. They're not going to Bible class today. They don't go anywhere. That's living independently of God. They don't serve. They don't give. No accountability. But they're going to be held to account. God first will discipline them. Wait, hopefully they wake up and get, to get, in, get your butt to Bible class and get under authority of a pastor who can teach you the word of God. He's a, his gift is given to the church to educate you and bring you to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to equip you to service. So that's how Christians live independently of God. I don't need his word and I don't want to do what it says. And they might not shake visibly their fist at God, but they're doing it in their hearts. They talk about a good game, but they don't, their hearts are far from God. God hates that. That's evil. Living independently of him. So, sin, evil, are contrary to his holy character and nature. We know what sin and evil is by virtue of God's character and nature. Sin didn't come into the universe until God's creatures said, uh-uh, I don't want to do it, God. Like your little kids will say, no, no. It's funny, you know, that funny how your little kids, or every little kid that comes in the world, include, uh, we're, no, we're no different, no. Isn't that one of the first words we say? No. We all do this. Why? Because we're sinners. We're under the, the condemnation of Adam. And we were delivered from that condemnation through faith in Jesus Christ. Now we're in union with Christ under his headship. So, praise be to God. We're not under the wrath of God anymore. But the world and everything around us is totally against God. And this is the devil's world. And you and I are in the midst of it. And God has not called us out of the world. He's in the sense that he's going to, take, he's going to eventually take us out bodily. But he's kept us in the world to lead these people who are enslaved to sin and Satan like we used to be. Lead them to freedom. What true freedom is. Which is worshiping and serving Jesus Christ. And being in union with him. And identified with him. So... God's wrath refers to his legitimate anger towards evil and sin because both are contrary to his holiness or perfect character and nature. In fact, God's righteous indignation expresses his holiness which pertains to the absolute protect, uh, perfection of his character. His holiness is expressing the purity of his character or moral, moral perfection and excellence and means that God can have nothing to do with sinners sinners. He is totally separate from sin and sinners unless away can be found to constitute them holy. And that way, thanks be to God, has been provided based upon the merits of Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. So, 
I want to show you something. Go to Romans chapter 1. Famous passage on the wrath of God. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 18. Romans 1 18. Romans 1.18, Paul's writing uh, in context about the Gentile world. He goes and talks about the Jewish uh, society in chapter 2. And then basically in those two chapters, he says both Jew and Gentile are guilty before God. Uh, n they don't have the righteousness of God. They don't measure up to God. They're not perfect. They're sinners before God, both Jew and Gentile. All in the, And then he says in Romans 3, he sums up both of them saying, there's none righteous, no, not one. And they're all, all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. Thus they all need to be justified through faith in Jesus Christ. They don't have the righteousness required to live with him forever and to coexist with God. So Romans 1.18, famous passage on the wrath of God. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their right unrighteousness. Notice that they, the world, the people of the world, just name who, anybody, human beings, okay, the human race. They suppress the truth. This is something that they do. It's very important because you're going to understand something that the world doesn't tell, tell you this and the media will tell you opposite of what Bible, the Bible says. But they're doing the suppressing of the truth. And he's talking about the truth of God in creation. There's, God's revealed himself in creation. He's revealed himself in the soul of every person that he's created, where he created in his image. And he's also revealed himself through the personal work of Jesus Christ during his first advent. And he's revealing himself through the Bible and the church. Okay? So God has not left himself without a witness in the world. People can't say, I didn't know there was a God. Oh, there's, nobody will be able to say that. Because creation contradicts what they're saying. They, do, they, they choose not to know that truth. Because they want to live independently of God. So then it says in verse 19, Because what can be known about God is plain to them. Now, now you hear me say, now you know why I say, there's no such thing as an atheist. The atheists know there's a God. They could tell you that they don't, and they could march around the street and take that one, that one, all references to the Bible and Jesus Christ and the Ten Commandments, taken off of our public buildings or whatever. You know, they can do all they want, but they've just basically, they're denying the obvious to them. God says he's made it plain to them. And this is why the wrath of God is on them. They rejected the truth of him in creation because God made it plain to them. So nobody has any excuses for the fact that they can't say that there's no God. They know there's a God. I just don't want to worship him. And why they don't want to worship him? We'll study that in John 3 in a few moments. Because they want to do things their own way. Because they don't want to be told that they're sinners. They don't want to have to be held accountable. Look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's, his, his, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. So basically saying, the complexity of the time matter space continuum. In other words, to roll it all down, look at yourself, look at the creation. It's so complex. In fact, what we've learned about DNA should cause everybody to be humble and say, wow, there's a God. Because that is no accident. That, that happened. That's, that's, with those little machines, that DNA, unbelievable. You can't tell me there's no God. It was an intelligent mind behind that. So God's saying, they can't, they know about this. They could just look at creation. They're fearfully and wonderfully flea made. And you just look at yourself. I remember the, when I, somebody evangelized me when I was 18, 19 years old. They mentioned that about me. He said, Billy, look at you. You are you. I mean, they did something really funny. It was like, it sounds simple minded and everybody's looking for the, but it really caused me, like, look at your hand. You can do this. That's amazing, Bill. Think about that. You take it for granted every day, but look at that hand. You can see that hand, and that hand's moving, and you can make it move. And yeah, look at that tree. Look how complex these things, how complex you are. And I remember somebody telling me that, and that really, well, it, the Holy Spirit used that basically to help me wake up. And I use, I use that now on other people that I know that are non-believers. I know that that's something they don't know. I know, because the Bible tells me, that they know there's a God. 
They're just living in denial. That's all these, that's what he's saying there. Because they have no excuse. They know there's a God. And this is why the wrath of God is against them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen because they are understood through what has been made. That would include themselves. They're made by God. So people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts and their senseless hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for an image resembling mortal human beings or birds or four-footed or four -footed animals or reptiles. Idolatry. As far as the human beings, that's the Greeks for you. The Greeks did that. Now look what he says in verse 24. Notice that all started because they refused to reject God's revelation of himself in creation. They refused to acknowledge God and worship him. They're without excuse. Now look at the result of doing that. Because this will give you an insight as to the culture that we live in today in the 21st century and so-called alternative lifestyles thing that's going on in our country. It's the direct result of God's judgment. Look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over to what? Therefore means based upon this, that they chose to reject God in creation to acknowledge him and worship him. They're without excuse. Therefore, it ties us back to those verses. God gave them over. It's judgment. And the desires of their hearts to impurity, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Look what it says. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped the serve the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, because they did that, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. What is that? Lesbianism and homosexuality branches amazingly. For their women exchanged their natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In other words, guys, instead of having sex with a guy, they want to have it with women. Likewise, the men also abandon natural relations with women. Now, God says it's unnatural to have sex with the same, per uh, same sex. sex. He says it's unnatural. That's what the Bible says. I don't care what the world says. And why did he do that? They're under God's wrath. God judged them because they rejected him to worship in creation. So stop buying the lie out there. Even in the church, it's amazing to me. People buy the lie that they can't help it. Or it's, um, I was born this way. So let me tell you this. God created you in his own image. And he says homosexuality and lesbianism, lesbianism are a sin. And you're going to tell me he's going to contradict himself? And made you to be a homosexual and a lesbian? Baloney. But see, the culture is so strong. This is what I tell you, I tell you, kid, I tell you about your kids. When you get them ready for college and high school, the world is so immersed. And you're going to be looked like a, a nut because you think what the Bible says. Because the world says, they can't help it and all that stuff and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, baloney. That's baloney. That's because my Bible says they're wrong. So you have to make up your mind whether you're going to believe it. And if you believe it and you hold to it, and what's going to happen is you'll probably be ridiculed. So if you don't like that, join the club because Jesus and the prophets and the, of Israel and the apostles were ridiculed as well. But it takes courage to stand up for God in this devil's world who's living, living independently of God. Now, keep all this in mind because that's not the end of the story here about these people. God sent his son of the cross to die for all these people. So verse 26, for this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged the natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. And likewise, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed in their passions for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in themselves the due penalty of their error. Basically, they result, think about all the diseases that have taken place because of homosexual behavior. And the world will be telling you, oh, it was, it, it was heterosexual of all, too. Yeah, you can get disease from heterosexual sexual behavior, but homosexual behavior results in disease, too. In fact, the Greeks were all immersed in that, and the, the, the Greek culture was destroyed with that. The fabric of their society was destroyed. Same with the, the Romans were involved in it, too. And our country would be indoctrinated every day. Television, TV, it's all right. Yeah, you, you can believe that, and you're going to be in error. You want to live in error? You want to live against God? Verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what not, should not be done. 
That's judgment, people. Homosexual behavior, deviant behavior like that, is a judgment from God. God has handed them over to the lie to dishonor their bodies. That's God's wrath today, people. God's wrath is being exercised today in society all around us. And it's going to be exercised ultimately. The, the, the greatest danger they have is the lake of fire. And if they don't repent and trust in Jesus Christ the Savior, they're going to face the worst situation, worse than uh, that judgment of homosexual and lesbian, lesbian, uh, lesbianism. They're going to be judged in the lake of fire. We don't want them to go there. We want to save them. And all people, whatever they're, uh, they're fornicating heterosexuals, or whoever they are, murderers, we want to save them from the wrath of God. That's why we're left on the earth, people. One of the reasons is to get the gospel to these people so they can avoid the wrath of God. So we just can't write them off. And thank God nobody wrote me off. Look at verse, and listen to me. There are many people today in the church who are lesbians at one time and, and homosexuals. They're not practicing anymore. They've been delivered from it. They're a great testimony. Verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what should not be done. They're filled with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, covetousness, malice. They, they are rife with envy, murder, strife, deceit, hostility. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, contrivers of all sorts of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, covenant breakers, heartless, rootless, although they fully know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but also approve of those who practice them. Now notice what he says, although they fully know God's righteous decree, that those who practice the such things deserve to die. Evan, one, how do you know that? They have a guilty conscience. You know what people try to do when they have a guilty conscience? And this is going on in our culture today. They try to justify their behavior. You know one of the reasons why people come out, out of the closet and say, I am a gay man and I'm a gay, I'm a lesbian now. I, I, I'm on, you know what? Because they're trying to get approval from people so that they can justify their behavior. The final judge is not people. The final judge is God. And he's just given his judgment. They're under his wrath right as we speak. Now go to John chapter 3. Here's some good news. That's the bad news. Let's look at the good news for these people, which we benefited from too. Go to John's Gospel chapter 3. John 3, 1. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now, a certain man named, a certain man, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling class, council, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miracle, miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus replied, I tell you the solemn truth, unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? He cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time, can he? And Jesus answered, I tell you the solemn truth, unless a person is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must all be born from above. The wind blows where it will, wherever it will, and you hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus replied, How can these things be? And Jesus answered, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? When he says the teacher of Israel, he was a prominent teacher in Israel in his day. I tell you the solemn truth. We speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen, but you people do not accept our testimony. If I have told you people about earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, speaking of himself. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, Old Testament, so must the Son of Man be lifted up the cross, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And the, everyone, notice everyone, no exceptions. That's speaking of the people of Romans chapter 1 we just read about. Christ died for those people, and any one of those people the murderer, the, hacker, the, uh, the, the fornicator, the, the lesbian, the, the, uh, the, the homosexual, whoever, whatever the person is, they trust in Jesus, Christ died for them. Okay? Everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For in this way, 
God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world should be saved through him. That's God's desire. All those people we read in Romans 1.18 through 31. God loves those people. They were created in his image. How did he show his love? What sent his son to the cross, his one and only son. The one who believes in him is not condemned. The one who does not believe has been condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the one and only son of God. Notice your sins don't send you to the lake of fire and condemn you before God and to face his wrath in the lake of fire. No, it's your rejection of Jesus Christ because every sin in human history, past, present, and future, of every person in human history, past, present, and future, was imputed to Christ, credited him on the cross, and he was judged. He bore the consequences for our sin. So therefore, we saved on his merits and the merits of his work on the cross that saves us. The only sin that sends you to the lake of fire is to reject Jesus Christ. And of course, you could reject him over a lifetime, but at the very end, you trusted in him, you're saved, you're going to heaven. But ultimately, you, if you don't trust in him, there's the lake of fire facing God's wrath. So then he says, he goes on to say in verse, uh, again in, in, in that verse, in verse 18, the one who believes in him is not condemned, the one who does not believe has been condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Now this is the basis for judgment that the light, speaking of himself, Christ, has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light. This is why they won't trust in Jesus. They'd rather sin, they love sin and live independently of God than to trust in Jesus Christ. I don't want to worship him. That's why people say, oh, the lake of fire. I can't, you know, people are going to conscious torment in the lake of fire forever and ever. They're going there, not because God wanted them there. We just read that. They go there because they want to. In fact, they would never be happy in heaven. Because of what he says here. They don't want to be with him. They'd rather be apart from him. Now this is the basic. What is God going to do? Well, they're going to face my wrath. I didn't want this. I sent my son to face my wrath on the cross so you wouldn't face my wrath. The light is coming to the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. Because all their, their actions are independently of him. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that their deeds will not be exposed. That's why our culture is the way it is. That's why human race is the way it is. They justify their behavior because they don't want to come to the light. They don't want to be, have their actions, their sinful thoughts, words, and actions exposed for what they are. Sin and rebellion and evil against God. That's why. Verse 21, but the one who practices the truth comes to the light so that it may be plainly evident that his deeds have been done in God. But look, at verse, look at verse 31. Jesus says, or John says, the one who comes from above, Jesus, is superior to all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks about earthly things. The one who comes from heaven, Jesus, is superior to all. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The one who has accepted his testimony has confirmed clearly that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent, Jesus Christ, speaks the words of God, for he does not give the Spirit sparingly. Now look what he says. The Father loves the Son and has placed all things under his authority. He will be the final judge of every human being. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. <clears throat> now look at that. Believes. What does that mean? You to believe in Jesus Christ, it means that you acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you have no ability whatsoever to get right with God independently of Jesus Christ. I need Jesus to get into heaven. I need to get the forgiveness of sins through faith in him. I, I accept them, on them based upon the merits of the object of my faith. I'm turning to him to spare me from God's wrath. You don't have to walk an aisle, raise a hand, give money to a church, or do penance, or feel repent for all your sins. Nobody can do repent for all their sins. We have too many to repent from. That's silly, foolish, that's not even taught in the scriptures. No, you believe in Jesus Christ. Believe. Trust in him. The one who rejects the son will not see life. But look what it says. But God's wrath remains on him. Now God's intention is to spare all people from his wrath. That's why he sent his son. The Edomites. God didn't want to judge them. 
He wanted to spare them. But they said, no, I'm not going to listen to the, you, the God of Israel. We're going to do things our own way. And you know what? Your way is the wrong way. And it leads to destruction. And nations after nations commit the same crime, the same sin, and individuals throughout history commit the same sin over and over and over again. Thus, the idiocy of a child of God trying to go back and live like they used to before they were as a non-believer. You're a child of God. That's not what you're supposed to You're living inconsistently of who God made you and saved you to be. Someone to have fellowship with him, an eternal relationship with him, not to live independently of him. So, we're talking, as we close here with our class here, a couple of things here. The presence of evil, sin, and injustice is totally absent in God's character. God does not tolerate sin or evil because it is contrary to his character, his inherent moral qualities, ethical standards, and principles. Therefore, God's holiness refers to the absolute perfection of his character, expressing his purity of his character, or moral perfection and excellence and intolerance and opposition and rejection of sin and evil. Thus, God is totally separate from sinners sinners. Thus, God's holiness is related actually to all of his divine attributes, or in other words, his holiness is simply the harmony of all of his attributes, or some call them attributes, perfections. Therefore, God's wrath, which is in reality his righteous indignation, is an expression of his holiness, righteousness, and love, and opposition to sin and evil. God's wrath, or righteous indignation, is used of God's settled opposition to and displeasure against sin, meaning that God's holiness cannot and will not coexist with sin in any form whatsoever. And when I'm talking about that, you say, well, God's letting this go. No, God's not having fellowship with the world and Satan and unbelievers. He's not having fellowship. This is what I'm talking about. He'll have fellowship with you and I when we obey his word. It's not God's wrath or his righteous indignation. It's not the momentary, emotional, and often uncontrolled anger to which human beings are prone. And does not refer to an explosive outburst. No, when God's righteous indignation is something that's in his character, God would not be God if he, if, he, if he accepted sin and evil, living independently of him. He wouldn't, if he accepted it, he wouldn't be God. We know what sin and evil is because of God, his character. He's pure. And this righteous indignation, it's, his, it's always there because he's always morally pure, pure and, and, and totally perfect. So he, it's not like some emotional outburst of God. He's not like a human being. The God is, has this, it's always there. In fact, people who live with, in the lake of fire forever and ever, the non-believer, unrepentant non-believers, who rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior, God's there the whole time, you know. They're not having a relationship with him. But think about that. If God's wrath is, they're going to be facing that and experience that for all of eternity, God would have to be there. Yeah, but they're not having fellowship with him. They're not having a relationship with him. They're facing his judgment, his wrath. God hates sin so much and loves the sinner so much that he judged his son, Jesus Christ, for every sin in human history. All the sins we mentioned in Romans today. He, he was judged for every sin, past, present, and future, and provided deliverance from sin and God's wrath through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. So think about that. The Son of God, the second member of the Trinity, not the Father, not the Holy Spirit, was sent by the Father, God the Son. He became a human being to experience God's wrath those hours on the cross in our place so that we wouldn't have to face his wrath for all of eternity. Imagine that. God says, these are my rules. You broke them. And now the consequences are, I will pay the consequences. That's what God did. And people don't love God? I don't want to think it just blows my mind. Wow, he really loves me. You know, he didn't send somebody. God himself said, I'll step down and become a human being and I'll take my wrath. I'll face my wrath. Basically, what he did. For us. Because he loves us. The only way, as we saw in John 3, 36, to avoid God's righteous indignation is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. And if the Edomites had repented and they were given centuries to do this. Generations to repent and to believe in the God of Israel, who we know is Jesus Christ. 
they had done that, God would have relented, just like he did with the Ninevites. He didn't judge them. He threatened judgment against them, but they repented, and he relented, as we saw in Jonah 3. God would have done the same thing for the Edomites, and he would have done that for any nation if they had repented, and he'll do it for any individual if they repent. So, hopefully, this class help you understand your God a little bit better. That's my prayer. And how, and apply, and I pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us in applying these things in our lives and give us a healthy respect for the Lord because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson be a great blessing to your people and guide them in the application of these things. And if there's anybody who's listening to my voice that is not trusted in Jesus Christ as as their Savior, and is therefore under the wrath of God. I'm here to tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. For the Father did not send the Son in the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Now you have a volition of free will, and you could say in your own words to God that you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior. To do so is not simply acknowledging his existence as a human being, but is acknowledging him as God risen from the dead, and that you're a sinner and you're, uh, you're an infinite gulf between you and a holy God. To trust in Jesus Christ means I'm trusting in his merits and the merits of his death on the cross to get me the forgiveness of sins and also to spare me from God's wrath in the lake of fire. That's how much God loves you. He sent his one and only son so that you wouldn't have to face his wrath all of for all of eternity. In fact, his son faced his wrath on the cross those last three hours on the cross. So the choice is yours. I can't make that decision. Your parents can't, your children can't for you, your wife, your, your husband, it's up between, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, it's between you and God. And my prayer is, and the will of God is, is that you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and be delivered from God's wrath. Again, Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray again that this lesson would be a blessing to your people and bring glory to you in your son, Jesus Christ, ultimately. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, we're going to take up our Sunday morning offering. And uh, as a congregational song, uh, I want to do a song I wrote some years ago, amazingly. It's called Where Are You? And it's on page 187, Where Are You? So we're going to take up our Sunday morning offering. And um, remember, we're, you know, we're a tiny little ministry, so uh, those who are supporting us, we thank you for, that, for, for doing that. But, um, and uh, we need to um, maintain uh, what, we're, the, the, what we're getting in for offerings. We need to maintain that so we can stay above water. So uh, let's uh, pray for this offering. Father, we pray that this offering would be under the power of the Holy Spirit in obedience to Galatians 6.6 6 and other passages. We pray it would be a blessing to the people who take part in it because your son taught it's more blessed to give than to receive. We also pray that it would produce thanksgiving to the recipient. And we also uh, thank you for those you've raised up that have responded in helping us out, that have been per, uh, faithful uh, for quite some time and supporting us, and also the new people who are becoming uh, involved in uh, helping us out uh, financially. We just thank you for them becoming joint partners with us in the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for this offering in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Where are you, Dr. Lawyer? 
your land of morals If you stand on your own You will stumble and fall For you won't stand a chance No, you won't stand a chance In the end Oh, yeah If you stand on your own You will stumble and fall For you won't stand a chance No, you won't stand a chance In the end Oh, where are you? Artist, poet, comic musician Where are you? Love a fighter Alone and dying Do you think it's a game? Well, there's a knock at your door Will you dare to believe? Will you dare to believe In the truth? Who is Jesus?